Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan, and on behalf of BookSoup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with John Dinsmore of The Doors and David Frick discussing The Seekers, meetings with, remark with remarkable musicians and other artists. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter at booksoup.com. This evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom center of your screen. If you see a, a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button and uh, we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, please consider supporting Book Soup and John Dinsmore by purchasing a copy of today's featured book. Just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue the checkout process. And I can, I might add, for people who are purchasing the book tonight, you will receive a signed book plate, uh, book plate signed by John. And now a few words about our featured guests. David Frick is a music journalist who, who has served as a senior editor at Rolling Stone magazine, where he's written predominantly on rock music. One of the best known names in rock journalism, his career has spanned over 40 years. He also hosts the Writer's Block on Sirius XM Radio and a weekly Tom Petty Channel radio program. Tonight he is in conversation with our special guest, John Densmore, an original and founding member of The Doors. Now, if we were in person tonight, this is where I would hold for applause. So in 1993, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And since then, he has earned a Grammy Award for Lifetime Achievement and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In addition to his best-selling book, Writers on the Storm, his writing has also been featured in the Los Angeles Times, Rolling Stone, The Guardian, Nation, and Chicago Tribune, among many others. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to John Densmore and David Frick. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Hi. <laughs> uh, there are hundreds of people out there uh, attending this sonic campfire. So I want to thank you for coming. In fact, wait a minute. It's time for wardrobe. Okay. No, actually, I'm not going to wear this. But this was made to me by made for me by Christ Novoselic and Darby, Darbury. His uh, smells like Teen Spirit bass player. Uh, so, welcome, Ron Kovic and Terry Allen are out there. Wonderful writer, born on the Fourth of July. So uh, it feels cool, like family. And uh, second, I want to thank Book Soup and Hatchet Books. And third, I want to thank this guy, <laughs> David Frick. Um, he's a really great writer, and he writes about music. And this book's about music. And so David knows the challenge of... Uh, trying to find the words that reflect the sound that one is hearing or, or a live performance that one is seeing. So I'm really pleased to have him here with us. Um, so I'm gonna just read a little paragraph that hopefully reflects um, what I saw in Gustavo Dudamel, the new uh, Wonder King conductor of the LA Philharmonic. Um, He's 30-ish, and he's, uh, he conducts from memory. Beethoven, Mahler, he looks at the notation and goes out with no score. It's all in here. Oh, boy. And he is also very aware of salsa and Led Zeppelin and jazz. And that's what makes, partially what makes him so great, because he's open to uh, the whole gamut of musical genres. And that's why this book is so diverse, because that's what fed me. All right, so I'm going to read this little section. Only I can't see it. Wait a minute. Yeah, okay. I got big print here. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> the L.A. Phil's new leader began by conducting with his eyebrows and his fingertips pianissimo, a little kitty kneading the air 
then playing with a small mouse. Then the tempo increased and he did a little sashaying from side to side, prancing as if marching in place. Then the demonic rose up for the fortissimo and, it, and his whole body pounced on the orchestra, exacting its prey of sound. I know a couple members of the orchestra and they say that even though he is not the composer, playing in his orchestra feels like your conductor is creating the music in the moment almost like jazz. So David Frick and I are gonna now uh, have a verbal little uh, riff exchange. Uh, take it, David. Well, actually, I think what I would like to ask first is you have written this book about musicians, writers, spiritual leaders that have given you inspiration and giving you advice and adventure, you know, encounters with these people. But how do you define a seeker? Because a musician, a lot of people are musicians, a lot of people try to write, and but being a seeker, there's a sense of mission and commitment to it that is it's a step above. And it's a very it's a very important distinction. Yeah, I'm going to try and evade that question. Um, <laughs> right, he evades you know, the first one. <laughs> we're, we're all seekers, you know. And uh, okay, here's a little something from the intro. Um, well, uh, the original book, Meetings with, with Remarkable Men, was written by Gurdjieff, an Armenian Russian mystic in the 1800s. And he, um, he wrote about these. Uh, musicians trying to play so well that they catch the ear of God. And so I got this idea, oh, meetings with remarkable musicians, people that fed me. And so that's what this book's about, but not just them. So inspired by the Gurdjieff idea, I assembled my own group of what I would call musical masters who achieve their mystical sound through, mystical destiny through sound, from Ravi Shankar to Patti Smith, Jim Morrison to Janis Joplin, Bob Marley to Dudamel, Lou Reed, Van Morrison, Jerry Lee Lewis to my dear late Doors bandmate, Ray Manzarek. Just as painters see the world, musicians' primary compass through life is their ears. Like my colleagues, I hear the world. The one constant thread through my life so far is that I have been constantly fed and nourished by music. But Everybody can do this. Uh, you, you can get in the same zone, even if you're playing piano and no one hears it. So here's another little thing. If beauty is the only antidote to this modern crazy world, then as mythologist Michael Mead says, art is a form of refuge. And if that's true, then we're all refugees. We're all looking for a sanctuary, a place to feel at peace with ourselves and the world. William Blake said that each day has a moment of eternity waiting for you. So the book is a guide to all seekers, professional musician or not. You're in the same zone and you can open the door, pun intended, to the other world. Well, what would have been the first door that opened for you? Because you opened the book with reflections on your mother, Margaret, which I think is a really you know, everything begins with family. And you also mentioned uh, your junior high school teacher, music teacher, Robert Walsh. But then the first sort of name musician you mentioned is a guy that I have heard of. I never got to meet him. Fred Katz, who was the cellist in huh. the uh, group led by the drummer Chico Hamilton. That's right, and yeah. it was just funny because just about three or four weeks ago here in lockdown, I was watching Jazz on a Summer's Day, the very famous documentary about the Newport Jazz Festival in 1957, I think. And some of the footage is of Chico Hamilton rehearsing in a house in Newport, Rhode wow. Island. And you can see Fred Katz playing wow. cello with the band. And I'm like, man, that's the dude. And I then I read your chapter and I thought, you actually studied with him as you know, a, a young student, you were actually there getting instruction from somebody like that. What was he that first door? No pun intended. <laughs> well, 
one of them. <laughs> my, my mom was the very first because she encouraged piano and drums. But um, Fred Katz, um, I, I, I saw them at the Lighthouse in Hermosa Beach, a jazz club, uh, Chico Hamilton. And Chica was doing this thing on the bell of the cymbal. And I went, oh, man, I'm taking that. Steal from the best, you know? And uh, I actually did a audio version of this book. And I played some music under it. And so in that chapter uh, on Fred Katz, I play that bell beat, which I stuck in the end. So, you know, we're all on each other's shoulders. Now, what about Elvin Jones? Because he's the next one in the book. Elvin Jones, the fantastic historic drummer with John Coltrane's classic quartet. He's on a Love Supreme, so many amazing records. And you actually got to meet him when you were, I guess, maybe 17 or 18, when you snuck into Shelley's Manhole, a classic <laughs> club in the uh, LA area. And as a slight spoiler alert here, you used a fake ID from Tijuana? Yes, David. Uh, you know, those, uh, are the, those were the days you could do stuff like that. Yeah, well, the, the, the doorman knew it was fake and let me in anyway, because he, he could feel that I wanted to see my idols. And so the bathroom was near the dressing room. So I went to the bathroom a lot. I didn't have to go that much, but I hung around inside there because I knew on the other side of the wall was John Coltrane. And, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, play a little something that Elvin taught me about rhythm. Uh, th these are brushes like you use on a jazz drum set, but this is a doombeck, a mid-eastern drum. I'm just going to play it on here. Uh, this is Elvin influence. Hang on, I'm changing the lighting. All right. For drummers, the steady tempo is everything. No matter what you're playing rhythmically, if the pulse isn't implied, no one is going to care or be moved. Native Americans say that the powwow drum used in their dances is a steady singular rhythm because it's the heartbeat of Mother Earth. We drummers all know that our mother's heartbeat was the first instrument we heard. If your rhythm begins to falter a little, then the ensemble you're playing with won't hold and they'll be fearing that their mother's heartbeat just stopped and they were still inside the womb or in a song with a band. When your beat has a steady, consistent feel, the listener is comforted and can groove to the sound and enjoy the warm ambiotic fluids, the ultimate homeland security of a song. That's the drummer's thing, you know, rhythm, steady, steady rhythm. Well, given your passion for early passion for jazz and being able to connect with people like Fred Katz and Elvin Jones, what drove you to rock? And also that intense martial, I think, precision that you were able to bring to the doors along with that jazz heartbeat. You can hear that in Break On Through, it's certainly all over the end and when the music is over, it's that ability to be on the one, as James Brown put it, but also yeah. fluid enough to be able to react to improvisation and particularly in the case of, of Jim Morrison vocal improvisation. Actually seeing Elvin improvise with Coltrane, drummer's first job is the pulse, like I was saying. And actually I, I have a Thelonious Monk quote so brilliant, 10 things musicians need to know. Uh, and the first one is have a great sense of time. And then Thelonious says, especially if you're not the drummer. <laughs> oh my God, brilliant, fucking brilliant. It, you can play a solo on guitar or sax, but if you don't have the internal metronome, nobody's gonna care. 
because, um, you know, we all heard our mom's heartbeat and that's what brings us back together. And uh, that's why I <laughs> later realized that I, you know, I wrote about my mom because she encouraged me to do music. And then I just thought I'd put the first chat, uh, her on the at the first autobi autobiographical. And then I thought, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I came from her womb. Of course she's first, you know? That was the heartbeat I heard. Anyway, what was your question? No, but it's that it's that combination of like really precise, exact time, but being able to be fluid enough and reactive enough yeah. to respond to the yeah. improvisation, right. whether it was. And also it was interesting because in your job, there was no bass. Ray was playing the bass lines on the keyboard, but the kind of interaction you would have with a bass guitarist or the way Elvin did with Jimmy Garrison, you yeah. sort of had to have both of those roles in your head as you guys were navigating those 10, 12 minutes of the end or light my fire. What can I say? <laughs> uh, uh, seeing Elvin accompany Coltrane gave me the courage to kind of have more of a conversation with Jim. You know, Jim singing, what have they done to the earth? What have they done to our fair sister? Stuck her with knives in the side of the dawn, tied her with fences, dragged her down. So bang, 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 bang. That's yeah. you come in with those accents I, like the like trees are falling. Well, I had this impulse to stop the groove and have a conversation. What are they, you know, just programmatic to what he's saying. And then I went back to the groove later. Um, I don't know where that came from. I just you know, you follow your intuition, you know. What would have been your first serious encounter with, I don't want to say a pop star, but someone in the rock and roll game? I know that the Doors uh, played with Jim Mar Van Morrison at the Whiskey in 1967, and you actually discussed that in the chapter on Van, and you also tell a very classic story about joining Van on stage in 2008 at the Hollywood Ball. And I won't spoil it for people here because it's really, really good. But uh, I actually talked to Van Morrison uh, a couple of years ago and I asked him about that night at the Whiskey when he came oh, on stage. They were on stage. Uh, he came, he was touring with them. They were on the bill the same night. I guess you guys were opening for them. Yeah. And Van and Jim sang Midnight Hour and Gloria together. Yeah. And I asked him about that. And he said he said this about Morris. And he said he was really raw. He knew what he was doing and could do it very well. One thing that surprised me in their set was that Kurt Vile song, meaning Alabama song. Yeah. Nobody thought of doing that then. So regardless of his reputation for irascibility, Van Morrison could see the quality and invention in what you guys were doing and what Jim was doing that night. Could you get any vibe back from him that night or was it just a, one of the blurs of a night on the sunset strip? No, no. When, when, when Van opened up his pipes at the whiskey, I, I felt ancient Irish angst and I related, <laughs> you know, just powerful. And uh, Jim was raw. Here, let me read you a little section of when I first met Jim. Um, Jim Morrison, the shaman, with your feet on the ground, earth spirits rise up the legs. My third encounter with someone who seemed to have access to the other, other world was when I first met Jim Morrison. His direct line to the other side hit me quick. I was jamming at Manzarek's garage when Ray handed me a crumpled piece of paper with Jim's lyrics to break on through. A day destroys a night, night divides the day, tried to run, tried to hide, break on through to the other side. Right? Now, not only were the lines rhythmic, which I as a drummer appreciated, but he was talking about a connection to the void, a raising of consciousness. The words were pulsing with feelings of a seeker, Someone trying to tell us that life's bittersweet, but there's something else. So when I when I hear into the mystic, I completely forgive Van for what you will read about at the end <laughs> of that chapter. 
<laughs> but it's interesting that he actually had that same incantation style of singing that in many ways, you know, connected what Jim did as a lyricist, as an aspiring poet, you know, with images and that kind of almost juxtaposition and what would seem like non sequitur to a lot of people reading things in a linear fashion, but in fact are putting together like these composite portraits of images and tensions in your head. They really were very close together in sort of in their seeking in a way. Well, they both had the same last name. <laughs> That's true. Uh, they were both searchers and brilliant. Um, here, let me give you a little something that, uh, you know, this starts with Tom Petty. I'm, I'm sure that you, just like me, are still aching at his crossing over. But the late, great Tom Petty, the superb song craftsman, told me a theory of his when we were talking about Jim. Some artists, the very, very great ones, come along with the flame turned all the way up, and the flame is all the way up, and you use a lot of fuel fast, and, you, and you've just got to get the heat that comes off of that. Morrison was full of creativity, and that had to get out one way or another. The spirit in the bottle eventually doused that flame, but all of us were blessed with his creative spirits for 27 years that he roamed the planet and gave us the gift of sound. And uh, Van's still giving us beautiful gifts, which is wonderful. Well, that Tom Petty quote really struck me because I interviewed Tom quite a bit, particularly in the last uh, decade and change. And one of the things that we talked about a lot was his ability to have re working relationships with people like Bob Dylan and George Harrison mm -hmm. and Johnny Cash, people he grew up admiring and aspiring to, to be like. After I, Jim's- I, I so much wanted to be in Jim Keltner's drum seat playing with <laughs> the berries, but I loved Jim, so. Um, the thing that I'm curious about is that in, in the 70s after Jim's passing, did you often meet other artists, younger artists like Tom, who wanted to know what you knew about Jim those days, how you survived it, and then the lessons that you could then pass on to them? Tom was able to get them firsthand from Harrison and Dylan and Johnny Cash. In the case of somebody like Morrison, people had to turn to you, Robbie, Krieger, Ray Manzarek, you know, the guys who were there in the room with him. Creativity and self-destruction came in the same package with Jim and Janice, who I also write about. It doesn't have to. Um, you know, Picasso lived in 90. Uh, I'm on a longer road. Um, just follow your intuition, you know, and... and, 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 and paint or play the piano or... or uh, every day a little bit and it'll you'll get in the same uh, in infinite space that musicians do so there's two cents well given uh the, the fascination of interests in the doors continuing and with you and robbie now as surviving members how hard was it for you to write about ray in the book you have a great chapter on him simply titled mm -hmm. improvisation uh, how hard was it to write after his passing in 2013? You had a complicated relationship in some of those later years, which is well documented, but you write about him in this chapter with an admiration and fondness. And actually one of the things that struck me was that you point out that if you and he had not had the same response to Jim's early lyrics, like Break On Through or Moonlight Drive, there would not have been a Doors. Robbie didn't come until a little later. So it was really the fact that you and Ray were on the same wavelength for that writing, for that personality that gave the Doors the setting and the starting point to become a band and then history in the making. Yeah. Well, Ray's left hand was the bass player. So the bass players and drummers are the foundation. Uh, 
let's not discount when Robbie came along, <laughs> brilliant songwriter, wrote Light My Fire, and uh, it's been downhill ever since that song. You know? <laughs> uh, but uh, my connection with Ray musically was really deep, and it's 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 deeper. I just oh, I miss uh, I miss hitting the groove with with Ray. So uh, let me read a little Ray chapter here. Um, even amid, um, amongst those uh, philosophical and personal struggles, you know, the, the fighting over the name and all that, uh, the two of us never lost the almost telepathic communication we had on a musical level. Ray understood the avant-garde. He understood the dark matter. He was comfortable as I was with venturing outside traditional rhythmic chord structures. But he also knew that eventually you had to get back or you'd leave the cosmos and your audience behind. So w when to come back, it can only be answered intuitively. The astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson says, the earth doesn't just rotate around the sun. It is also affected by the gravitational pull of all the planets in our solar system. A musical ensemble is the same. The rhythmic section, me and Ray, vibrate at a low frequency supporting the lead players. All the celestial bodies in our solar system push and pull each other to varying degrees while the sun is the lead singer. <laughs> Balance is everything. If the ice caps are melting or if the guitar player is too loud, life gets out of balance. Keanu Scotzi. That's what really accomplished music that's why really accomplished musicians listen intently to their fellow players they put aside their egos if one of the musicians gets a little too full of himself when he's the focal point the star the surrounding planets have to adjust but sometimes the star spins out of orbit and no amount of adjusting pulls him back so yeah Jim I, I used to say that Jim was a, a you know a shooting star meant to last 27 years and as time went on I I I I felt more accepting of that you know it's hard to lose a friend but uh. and I think one of the things that is not always easy for people to understand is that they become so connected to the music the records the impact and the imprint that that work left that they can sometimes forget that there were friendships involved, there were personal relationships and both disappointments and just wonderful consummation of ideas, laughter, that a lot of what people are hearing on those records is the sum total of more than just notes, improvisation, and musical interaction. The friendship has to be there for the music to last. Yeah, and um, in it, I quote George Harrison uh, talking about uh, his relationship with John and how uh, he feels really close to John, even though he's crossed over. And George says, you know, I mean, if you can't feel something that deep with a, a friend that you really cherish, how are you going to feel Jesus or whoever you're searching for out there? Uh, you know, so like the Fab Four, the Fab Doors, uh, and there's only two left with each man. And um, yeah, if you are one of those four, it is a private club, but it all it also is a, a club that is totally grateful to you folks out there for getting what we're up to. We it's feed the, you, you feed it's, us. It's the energy of the extended family. Yeah. Uh, uh, being in a rock band is polygamy without the sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are um, they laughing out there? Okay. Um, there are two drummers that you include in uh, The Seekers. Uh, I want to ask you actually about both. Of them. One of them is Emil Richards. Uh, who is really one of the most gifted percussionists who has ever walked the earth. Uh, jazz composer, performer, session musician. This is a guy who ran the gamut from Frank Sinatra to Frank Zappa's Lumpy Gravy 
and the composer Harry Parch, which <laughs> to me is unbelievable. Now, one of the things that you mention in the book is that you write about watching Emil Richards at a film scoring session that was being engineered by you, the Doors engineer, Bruce Botnick. What kinds of lessons did you take from experiences like that and pull back into the Doors music, those records, your own conception of what rhythm and that evolving mother heartbeat should be like what did you get from Emil Richards either watching him or talking to him yeah well uh back to Shelley's manhole and I'm 17 years old and I'm seeing the Paul Horn quintet and Emil is playing vibes I mean they're like my idols they're my I'm, you know and then later uh they were involved in the Maharishi meditation thing as I was. And so there was a jam session and I got to jam with them, my heroes and show them I knew how to do their stuff. You know, it just fed me so much. So it's just uh, improv. Jazz is, um, I would say jazz musicians are spiritual by nature, you know, a love supreme. They're, they're searching. They're really searching. Uh, Improvisation is in the moment all the time, and uh, that uh, that affected us. Like for example, um, the solos in "Light My Fire" are on two chords, and those are the two chords that were used uh, in the um, I don't know if it's the verse or the chorus of "My Favorite Things," which Coltrane covered. Uh, beautifully, you know, this sort of corny Broadway thing, but he made it his own. And we were so inspired, we we uh, kind of <laughs> took the two chords and changed it. It was in 4-4 four, four instead of 3-4. But that that kind of stuff, you know, you, you just take from whatever seeps in. The other uh, percussionist that you mentioned is Erto Moreira from yeah. Brazil, who was a founding member of Weather Report, with Joe Zawinul and Wayne Shorter, and also a founding member of Chick Corea's Return to Forever. And you yeah. mentioned seeing Erto with his own group, with his wife, the singer Flora Parim, at the Whiskey, which yeah. would have been your old haunt from 66 on the Strip. What was it like to hear something that striking, that, I don't want to say exotic, because it was not simply exotic. It was actually very profound, uh, rhythmic, and vocal expression. What was it like to hear that in a room that you actually knew so well from another time? Yeah. And actually a whole other cultural setting. Yeah, these, these Emil Richards, Ayerto, uh, you know, a lot of you folks out there probably haven't heard of them, but um, they're as, as gifted as all these other really famous musicians. Um, Ayerto... Uh, He's a magician. I mean, I saw him take a little tambourine. Uh, where's my tambourine? And, and do some stuff. It, it sounded like an orchestra. I thought I was in the Brazilian rainforest. And he'd, woo, he'd make these noises with his mouth. Um, uh, and at the end of that chapter, I, I tell you where to go to in YouTube to, to see this. And, you know, I'm not crazy. The guy is a, a healer. He does a jam with a little kid who's sort of impaired and just the two of them, he teaches them and he starts playing music with them. And, and it's so touching. Anyways, these are, you know, uh, his heart is on his sleeve and I could hear it. Well, we have uh, a number of questions here from folks that I want to get to, but just before we get to that, I do want to ask one other thing that came to mind when I was, looking initially over the, the list of seekers and the table of contents and then reading through. And I'm curious, who were some of the other artists, seekers, writers, uh, spiritual people that you considered writing about or did write about that didn't make the final cut? And what is it about these two dozen that make the case for you in terms of seeking? like actually staying on the path and having yeah. these kind of people actually by your side at every moment because the music is always there. 
Well, I really don't have uh, uh, meetings with remarkable musicians part two coalesced in my mind, you know. Um, <laughs> but who knows? We'll see. But I'm thinking of the last chapter, Willie Nelson. You know, Willie's like 87 or something. I'm 76. And he's a teacher on how to do it that way, the long road. I'm going to give you a little taste of him. Speaking of calm, this book's last sound tracker has one of the calmest set of eyes on the planet. Hey, it's great to meet, meet a musician who's older than me, was my opening line to the redheaded stranger. Yeah, not too many of us left, huh? My wife, Ildiko, and I had been invited to Willie's Pad, where we had a very mellow afternoon. Have you tried this, John? Mr. Nelson said and handed me some of Willie's reserve. Hmm. I was prepared. I heard that Paul Simon and Edie Burkell had been there a few weeks earlier and left rather looped. Uh, but being loaded worked for Willie. It fit him like a glove. It's not for every, everyone. Uh, it wasn't for everyone, of course, as Toby Keith sang in, I'll never smoke weed with Willie again. I'm a cheap high, Willie, I said, taking one hit. Uh, Ildiko could smoke me and drink me under the table. I had no problem with that. Why don't you two smoke for me? And, and then uh, I went out and talked to the ocean. <laughs> but um, I guess when you ride on Willie's bus, you do more than just ride. <laughs> Yeah, but the thing is, he, um, he's, he, he, his phrasing on guitar, like his singing, has space in it. And that's what uh, that makes it so powerful. You know, like the, the flashiest technique is okay here and there, but it's sort of like breathing. And uh, you know what? I'm going to indulge a little drumming while I read a little more. And then we'll do the questions. Okay. All right. Uh, I said to Willie, uh, to me, a good song is the wedding between the lyric and the melody. I don't care if it's country, heavy metal, or pop. The way the words fit with the melody is what makes a great song, and you're a master craftsman. He smiled. Instant community, that's what music creates in people, especially live. Where it takes you on the life path doesn't seem so empty if it leads you through folks standing side by side, chanting, dancing, singing, and generally having a good time. As we exit the door of the bus, I took another chance at being Mr. Wood Nelson's straight man. Hey, Willie. How many times have you played on the road again? 6,000 times, he responds with a laugh. Yeah, well, that's about as many as we did on Light My Fire. And then I had one last look at those beautiful eyes and that craggy face. Uh, so, you know, he's a survivor, a teacher, and uh, feeds me greatly. Well, we're going to get to a question here. Actually, before I get to the first question, there is a comment here from a guy, from Rob, who mentions that uh, he saw. Uh, and he pronounces it I ear toe. Uh, <laughs> so I may have, that's my New York rock critic pronunciation. If I got it wrong, my apologies, Rob. Thanks for uh, correcting me on that. I know how to spell it. That's the important thing for a writer. Uh, Bridget asks, what would uh, be a valuable piece of advice you would give to your younger self? I'm assuming on this particular day or in this era. Like if Happy you could go back to your younger self, what would you advise oh. that John Densmore to do? Oh, breathe. <laughs> you know, it, it, you, you, as you get older, it, things are, uh, you can take it a little more uh, a yin yang, like my tattoo. Um, and what comes around changes like the government. No, oh, never mind. And so uh, <laughs> uh, just, in, you know, uh, stay loving and enjoy the ride somehow. Of course, we all get upset, but uh, that's my advice. We have one here from, uh, I hope I pronounced this correctly, uh, Louise or Louis. 
uh, Del Valle. Sorry, I did my best there. Uh, what artist would you have liked to have made music with that you didn't get the chance to? Bob Dylan. <laughs> did and, you try? And, uh, and I know that this book is on the way to his house. So, you know, I just, I just <laughs> admire the guy so much that if he ever wanted a little maraca on something, I'd do it. Well, actually, uh, the same gentleman asked this question. It's a good one. Is there an artist after meeting that was the total opposite of what you had imagined them to be? Wow. Well, I mean, you know, Miles. Oh, my God. Talk about cantankerous. Play it now. I'll tell you what it is later. That's one of his lines on one of his albums. Uh, yeah, M Miles, you know. It was so gifted. It, it created so many genres of jazz. But, you know, uh, they asked him, he was married to Cicely Tyson at the time, if she left him, uh, what would he do? And he said, I'd ah, play a major seventh chord. I'd be okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it, interesting how... A major seventh chord is melancholy. And, you know, this book is about sound and, you know, a major chord is sort of positive. A minor feels negative. Diminished is a little disturbed. Uh, not a major seventh, but a regular seventh is anticipation. You just feel anticipation because somehow our psyches want it to resolve to the major chord. Isn't that wild that... Sound can make our bodies feel goosebumps or sweat or laugh or whatever it is. So I don't know. Um, that's why I'm uh, writing about music. It's it's so direct. You don't look at a painting. You It goes in right here. Well, there's one here from Jason Conrad. And I actually, the opening line is what caught me. He mentions that the Soft Parade album is so underrated. And I actually feel that it is certainly one of the misunderstood records in your canon with Jim, Ray, and Robbie. And Jason mentions that he loves that Curtis Amy, the saxophonist, oh. is on that album. And he just, you know, he's just <laughs> fantastic on, uh, on Touch Me. And the question is, did you guys ever get to collaborate with any of the jazz greats? But I guess maybe really, did you ever talk about trying to do more in collaboration with other jazz musicians, because clearly yourself, uh, Robbie, and Ray were all schooled and passionate about it. And certainly Jim, as a vocal improviser, could have worked that way too. There is there is a lot of sort of unexplored territory there. We, we were fed by the jazz musicians. We, we didn't think we were quite as proficient technically, which we weren't, but then we, we wanted to find our own road which was influenced by jazz, playing with them. Uh, you know, uh, I have to say that I played with the LA Philharmonic and uh, <laughs> Herbie Hancock was in the audience and he came backstage and said, wow, great to hear you play live. And I was like, me? <laughs> uh, okay, fabulous, you know. So what can I say? A lot of mentors out there. Yes. Um, this one's from uh, Blanca Granados, uh, and she asks, in this evolving age of technology and digital music, what future do you see for physical collections and the preservation of rock and music's history? And certainly, in the case of your work, you know, what do you wonder about what the state of that preservation would be and how that influence can continue? <laughs> you know, there's a, a new technology keeps coming along and, and the delivery system gets different. And yeah, I lament analog and, and LPs where you can read and all that. Um, but it's just, uh, it's, it's more portable. You can have thousands of songs on your phone. That's really cool. Although this, the sound quality is not so great. So that's why uh, I do like all these indie stores that still hang on to that. 
um, and hopefully people will have collections. And uh, who knows what's next? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, streaming is what's going on now, that's for sure. Well, I know that the, the immediacy of streaming is very... Uh very tempting but as someone who is a record collector and i love writing about records and it's always an honor to have my writing included in liner notes i've been very lucky to have been written about the have written about the doors so much with these reissues that have been coming out but there is something about the physical uh, object that allows you to have a relationship with it that streaming doesn't provide you know, streaming is information. A record is <laughs> is basically a, an object of art. Yeah. Well, you know, like when drum machines were invented way back in the day, I was insulted. As Ringo said, I'm the fucking drummer. I'm the fucking machine. Um, and actually, the original drum machines had a human button where you push it and the machine rushes and drags the tempo a little. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> okay. But now trying to stay open, uh, drum machines became the vehicle for hip hop. You know, guys with no money got a drum machine. They didn't have to get a whole band and started rapping and, and doing a really great political stuff and some misogynist stuff. But uh, so I'm trying to stay open. That sort of jump started that whole hip hop world. So, so it goes. Well, there's a question here from Dustin Tripp, and uh, Dustin's a deep listener here because he asks, A, have you ever written a song? Now, you obviously write rhythms, conceive, uh, you know, that part of the music, but have you actually ever composed full songs of your own, vocals, lyrics, oh. the, whole, the whole nine yards? If you heard me sing, you'd know why I'm a drummer. Um, I had a couple tunes on uh, a couple of the so uh, albums after Jim died. The other voices and full circle yeah, records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, the thing is that Jim, um, he couldn't play a chord on any instrument. So uh, he'd go, uh, before you slip into, and it was stop, stop, hold it. F sharp. So we kind of, you know, eked it all out together. And it kind of felt like we were writing it all together, although he was the primary lyricist. And, and then Robbie brought in more complete songs. Because you were actually, in a sense, transcribing the inspiration from his head into, you know, notes and, you know, beats that everyone could collectively follow. And I think it's really important that you did for almost every record, with the exception of the Soft Parade, credit every by every all of the music to the Doors collectively, which yeah. I think really speaks to the real writing process that was involved. Yeah, one time a, a an MC introduced us, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Morrison and the Doors, and Jim <laughs> Jim went to the curtain side, dragged the guy back out there, and made him say the Doors. You know, very sweet. <laughs> Yeah, we did it all together, that's for sure. Well, uh, Dustin actually asked, you mentioned the uh, those albums that you made after uh, Jim passed. He asks, would you ever consider releasing concerts from the other voices or full circle tours? Because he would love to hear a live version of Ships with Sails. I told you he was listening uh, deep. I wasn't kidding. Yeah, we could consider that as long as, as George Harrison said, if there's any more Beatles material put out, we got to have the Surgeon General warning on it, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, here's actually a question, and, and it kind of relates to, you have one of the chapters in here about uh, encounters with Paul Simon. And there is a very interesting uh, description in here of, I guess, the point at which you the Doors and Simon and Garfunkel were on the same bill in New York. I believe that was Forest Hills Tennis Stadium. Correct. And that there was, you did have to talk later to Paul or at some point, you, I don't know if it was like an apology or like, well, you know, obviously that was a rough gig all around. Okay. <laughs> and not so, so easy for those guys. 
So I see Paul Simon a few years ago with his 12 piece or group playing the great Graceland and all this stuff, really inspiring. And so I went back and I said, hey, uh, Paul, uh, the last time I saw you was 50 years ago when we opened for you and uh, Artie at Garfunkel at, at Forest Hills. And I gotta say, uh, I wanna apologize for Jim being so rude to you before we went out. And he said, I remember that. <laughs> wow, okay. Here's this guy who's, you know, in, in the duo of the biggest group in the world and and our singers just kind of wouldn't speak to him or something. And I'm like, we're never gonna make it. God help us. And Paul and I talked 50 years later and he said, Maybe Jim was nervous. And I said, that's it. That's it. Covering, uh, you know, you know, like like Trump covers stuff with bullshit, you know, and, and nervous. So it was a healing there, you know, it felt really great. And and uh it's funny that he carried that story around for 50 years, too. You know. <laughs> um, we got one here from uh Rick Perkins, and he actually asked how the doors got involved in the Isle of Wight concert in 1970, which actually came out as an album and DVD a little while ago. And it's actually a really strong performance. Um, and the question being, was that a response to not being at Woodstock? And I guess really Woodstock occurred at a point when you guys really weren't sure you could tour because of the situation that evolved after Miami, which was March of 69. Um, we had played an outdoor venue and, and, and the acoustics are more difficult. It was one of the first, I don't know where, and Jim didn't want to play Woodstock. Um, were you I offered went, the gig? Yeah. I, I went to Woodstock though. I was on the side of the stage seeing Joe Cocker and going, wow, you know, so, um, but did you stand there and wonder if this could have actually we could have pulled something out of the fire given the state that we're in right now. I if you know. had been there. I, I thought we were playing clubs just before uh, Woodstock. I thought Miami was later. Oh, well. Well, and Miami was March of 69 and you did the two shows in Mexico city in June oh. or, or I think it was June of 69. Oh, you're and right. Then, it, 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 the Isle of Wight was in between the trial. Jim was on trial. That's why we played strong at the Isle of Wight, but he was yeah. kind of subdued because it was, you know, was stressful. We flew over there for the weekend. And, and of course, it turned out to be like the last pop festival, sort of. I mean, like Altamont or whatever, chaos and the end of the, the dream or whatever. Not, no, not the end. <laughs> I, I hate that the seeds of civil rights, feminism, peace movement were planted in the 60s. They're big seeds. They take ye uh, hundreds of years for full fruition. So there. We have one here from Mariano from Madrid. And it's actually an interesting question because wow. he says, uh, was there any influence of Spanish musicians or knowledge of flamenco rhythms? And in fact, Robbie was a huge flamenco fan and i know he when i interviewed him recently for uh, mojo magazine he was talking about uh Sabicus and segovia and yeah. how that was actually one of his teenage passions even before a lot of the rock and roll that became part of his sound yeah and and he used to you know he grew his fingernails real long and it would play the flamenco stuff and we were just enamored with the uh, the way it looked like a crab crawling across the those five strings. And then that's what the judge in Miami said that Jim was, uh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Jim was on his knees looking at the string player, not the, yeah, never mind. Um, here's one from uh, Tiffany uh, Fitzpatrick Gutierrez. Uh, and she wonders, are you working on any collaborations now with newer artists? And if so, who? And I guess when might we will you hear them? No. <laughs> no. Have you got have you got some things in mind that you would like to do? You're sitting there in front of that kit. Obviously, percussion is in the house and ready to ready to go. Yeah. You know, um, 
I've gotten off playing drums and reading poetry, which I'm going to do right at the end of this thing here. Um, and it feeds me as much as Madison Square Garden. I was doing this in little clubs. So I'm up to that, but I'm, I'm mainly into words. I'm looking for music in between sentences. Well, the, actually, this ties into something that Kara Johnson asks, and she says, as a painter, I am inspired by your music. Are there visual artists you pull inspiration from? Wow. Not specifically. I mean, you know, I can think of the Impressionist, and then I think of Debussy and uh, Ravel. Uh, uh, that's all I can think of right now. Do you, well, when you actually play or when you were in the middle of a gig with the band, uh, wherever it might be, the Whiskey, the Hollywood Bowl, the Fillmore East, did you have pictures in your head of what was happening? Like the way sometimes people can almost see something in the back of their head. It's like another movie that's rolling as... No, the music is as the music is just rising and taking other people places. No, that that's what I say in this book about how uh, musicians hear the world, painters see it. So sound vibration is the main thing for us. In the beginning was the word, right? And that's a sound, a yeah. vibration. You know, so uh, that's what I think uh, is really important, and it and can be can be healing. Yes. Well, that's, I can certainly speak to that because this is the reason why I wanted to be close to music. I got to do writing. I got to do radio. The music, it gave me, it gave me a place to be. And the first Doors record, I bought it in 1967. I've huh. still got it. And uh -huh. I also have my mono original Strange Days. And those records still take me to a certain place where I can actually picture what I wanted and what I was going to hope to achieve. And you, you were part of the thing that gave me something to work for. And in this pandemic, and we're all sort of in these bunkers. Oh my God, music, uh, you know, feeds you and you can go off into that zone and, and, get some relief. Well, actually, one of the things that I do in lieu of going to concerts, which I would do four or five nights a week wow. in a normal society, is I actually listen to live albums. I don't really watch streams as much because I feel the disconnect, not having the audience in a lot of places, you know, people playing in their, you know, bedrooms or in, you know, setups. And I understand that, but there's something about just hearing the applause on that record at the Isle of Wight that takes me there immediately. Oh, nice. Yeah, around that sonic campfire. Yes. Well, I'm glad we can at least do it virtually here because The Seekers, Meetings with Remarkable Musicians is a wonderful book. Book Soup is a fantastic store. Whenever I'm in LA, I go and I spend a lot of lunch money there. So I'm glad to be able to do that for those folks. And I think it's actually about time for you, John, yeah. to uh, give a little performance here for folks. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, close it out with um, Jim's, an excerpt from American Prayer, uh, his prayer for America. And um, we could we could use it, you know, yeah. Um, do you know the warm progress under the stars? Do you know we exist? Have you forgotten the keys to the kingdom? Have you been born yet? And are you alive? Let's reinvent the gods. Celebrate symbols from deep elder forests. Have we forgotten the lessons of the ancient war? 
Do you know we are being led to slaughters by placid admirals and that fat, slow generals are getting obscene on young blood? Oh, wow. I'm sick of doubt. I'm sick of dour faces staring at me from the TV tower. I want roses in my garden bower, dig? Royal rubies. Like, like the United States of America. <sighs> you know, in the red states, there's some folks who voted for Biden, so they're sprinkled with a little blue. And in the blue states, there's some red sprinkling. So it's not that polarized. Got to reach across the aisle somehow. Uh, I know, I know, men and women have different genitalia, um, but we all have the same heart. So, as the great Leonard Cohen said, democracy is coming to the USA. Not quite here. We're working on it. You know, back it's to always, Jim. it's always a work in progress. Back to Jim. Oh, great creator of being, grant us one more hour to perform our art and perfect our lives. Thank you, virtual crew out there. And thank, thank you, Rick. John. John Densmore live as the signs behind him say at the intersection of Morrison Street and Densmore <laughs> Avenue. The book is The Seekers Meetings with Remarkable Musicians. Purchase The Seekers as a little button under our windows. And John, thank you very much. This was a gas. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your time and your generosity. David, thank you for being our guide tonight. This was awesome. Um, uh, Everybody was cool. The questions were great. And John, he he brought he brought the heart and soul. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just a reminder that uh, when we end the broadcast, it, it's going to save and it will stay in the archive. So if you miss the beginning of the program, uh, you could watch it from the from the beginning after immediately after it ends. Please tell a friend. And also, don't forget, you could purchase the book from Book Soup and you'll get a book plate signed by John. John, thank you so much. David, thank you so much. You both have a great night. Thank you. Best to all. Peace. Bye -bye.